um, please introduce yourself and who you are and, and what you do. Sure, uh, my name is Jesus Sanchez. I'm the uh, executive director for the Children's Advocacy Center of Hidalgo and Stark Counties. We're in the deep south Texas um, in Hidalgo County. Great, and Rosita? Yes, so hello everyone. So my name is Rosita Rismondo and I also work for the Children's Advocacy Center of Hidalgo and Stark Counties. And um, I, I have the beauty of working remotely from Washington State, so I'm able to join Ms. Penny and Jesus today. Wonderful, thank you both for being here. So we know April is Child Abuse Prevention Month, and um, what we're trying to do is raise as much awareness as we can and help educate the world um, around this topic, but we're also in a really unique time with coronavirus, and the implications of that on uh, child abuse and sexual assault is pretty significant. And so I was wondering if you could share a little bit um, what's happening with your Child Advocacy Center right now and what are you seeing related to the state of the world? Yes, I think I'll, I'll start and then Rosita can, uh, can kind of help me out here. Uh, she's actually been an uh, integral part of making sure that we continue operations. But really, you know, what we're seeing is uh, right now it's just like, a lot of scrambling to continue to provide the same level of service. Uh, it seems like every every day we get new directions from local officials, um, yeah, you know, including from the, our, our federal government. And um, I think for us, the main part that we've seen is we had to basically start listening to the, um, the experts and start implementing measures from the beginning uh, from screening our, our staff, starting taking some extra measures to sanitize and uh, dis disinfect our, our center. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I feel like even to the point where we had to screen our staff twice a day, taking their temperature. Uh, now, recently, we basically just had a couple of uh, the cities locally that have implemented a cover your nose and mouth with mask, a bandana, or a scarf. And so we're uh, we're basically uh, in trying to implement that. Um, I, one of the main things for us, I think, is because we care so much for the children that come to see to our center, we, we feel like now it's almost like it, we try to scramble to figure out how we're going to be able, able to show that caring, child-friendly environment at the center. Uh, and uh, especially if you're, if you're coming in and basically we have somebody with the full suit outside mask and, uh, and basically screening for any symptoms and, and checking temperature. And uh, so one of the things that we discussed is like, man, can you imagine coming in after you experience some, some trauma and now we're basically testing them and uh, right before they get in there. And so it's, that's, it's a challenge. That's kind of what we're seeing. Um, as far as uh, services, I can tell you, we, we, over the last two, three weeks, we basically dropped to half or less than half the number of children that we brought up to the to the center we went from 45 to 50 interviews per week to now uh, last week not this last week we only had two it was uh, emergency cases but the previous week was only 13. so it's it's um uh, it's it's alarming that the number of cases that uh we're seeing are um are decreasing but uh the other thing that is alarming is that on the just in the last week we saw three three emergency cases it was like a, a physical abuse um, and sexual assault. So we know that the cases that we're gonna see over the next, at least until the shelter at home are in place, are gonna be uh, more um, critical. I, mean, I think there, there's just, um, it's just like it's extreme physical abuse and sexual assault. So those are the type of cases that we're seeing. We're seeing less, but the severity of the cases are definitely uh, higher. Rosita, did you want to add anything? Um, I, yeah, so I, you know, to piggyback off on Jesus, you know, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, now we, as the child abuse professionals that we are in front of what needs to happen is become quite challenging for us to be able to maintain um, the safety of our staff, of those clients who are coming into our building, 
and Jesus touched a little bit on what we're doing at the level of our center on screening our staff and our kiddos as they're coming in. But what's even more concerning for us is that the, those folks that we count on to report these child abuse cases or alleged abuse of a child, those are our teachers, our child care providers, our pediatricians, and all those professional folks that we call mandated reporters in the state of Texas are not seeing these kids on a regular basis. So um, the cases that we are seeing are far few from what our normal day or week would look like, but those that are coming in as emergency basis is they're very critical and very ter you know, terrible cases that the emergency cases that Jesus has talked about. So now more than ever, we worry even more about what is this doing to those kiddos that are at home and are not, they don't have nowhere to go to, to ask for help because they're, they're not going out, they're not going to school, they're not going to the doctor's offices. So those are the measures that we are looking at as far as, like Jesus says, at the CEC, how do we maintain um, that service-related um, moving forward? How do we get these kiddos to be able to feel safe to tell someone if something's happened to them without having to go tell the teacher or tell a doctor or something like that? Um, it's important that we, we remember that, that in these times, it's it's a game changer for a lot of these kiddos and so we have to reach out to them somehow somewhere and educate the parents or the caregiver who's staying with them at home uh, to make sure that they understand that we're still in the front lines and more so than ever now and that we put all these places all these things in place at the cc to maintain that social distancing that we need to to keep our staff safe as much as we can and also to be able to see the child when they come into the center and make sure that they their voice is heard. Thank you for that. So we're seeing less reports, but more se severe reports, it sounds like. Yes, because um, the reports as a nation, what we're seeing is the calls have dropped for the statewide intakes, but that it's because children are not going to school. They're not out there. you know. They feel they that was our their line of communication for a lot of our kiddos is they go to the counselor or the teacher or even for physical abuse cases the teacher might uh, know or see visible injuries or there's something off with that child that day that prompts them to have a relationship with the child and ask those very very difficult questions are you okay is everything okay or I see that you're withdrawn today you know, though, that's not happening right now. While these kids are at home, we don't have that outside uh, professionals to help with these kiddos with whatever that may be that is going on. So for those reasons, we just, um, you know, it's gonna be very scary to see what's gonna happen once these kiddos do go back to school. Uh, Cause I, I, we do know, um, studies do show that after situations like this, that we will see a huge increase in the number of child abuse reports coming into our statewide intake. And one of the, one of the things that I, uh, that was reading is I think it, the decrease is almost like 2000 calls per day, less than that typically the statewide intake receives. And basically what the, and, uh, what they're saying is uh, it, it really is just typical like if the kids were out in summer break. So mm -hmm. basically we, we should expect the surge of cases once we're there able to come back to school. Uh, and so at the same time that we're, uh, for us, what I'm thinking is, you know, long term is, do I have enough staff? Do I have the capacity to be able to take those cases when everything goes back to normal? Uh, we, we uh, prior to COVID, we already had capacity issues. We, um, we had about a week to a week and a half uh, before we can bring, bring um, our children in. And uh, so now I'm thinking, you know, if I'm, I was not able to, I was already looking to, for ways to increase our capacity. Uh, it's going to be important to know that, you know, we have funding available to make sure that we are able to 
uh, address that capacity uh, that we have in place. And the other thing long term for me is, you know, we we have two buildings there that uh, are about eight thousand square feet. But uh, the way that we were operating right now, we had multiple people in one office and uh, the number of families that we had at one point, I can tell you uh, on any given day, we probably had close to 50 to 60 people come through our doors. And so now with social distancing, uh, we're thinking with those type of measures in place, I think, you know, we're going to have to be dealing with this for for a while, I, I don't see I don't see the measures going away in the next six months. Uh, I'm I'm really uh, I'm really uh, I think the word is scared that we're not going to be able to reach all those children, and, and so um, that's kind of really the the challenge that, especially those that are in a more more uh, rural I guess rural area to the poverty levels. Uh, uh, it's pretty high and the the number of big companies that can donate to us is not as uh, as large as in bigger cities uh you know we, we've outgrown the, the the buildings that we have uh probably two three years ago so for me is that's the bigger outlook that i'm looking at funding capacity if i have to keep these measures for a long term how am i going to be able to keep the same level of service the same level of staff without having people basically on top of each other and that's the reality of it that's what we're going to have to deal in, deal with going forward um, you know i hear different things that is going to happen with this virus one is it will go away two we find the vaccine and we we uh, prioritize those that need it the most which is our you know our, our 60 and over uh, right now or this could be like the flu it will come back every year and and for me that's i'm already thinking about that so it seems like these are the measures that we have in place are probably going to have to be measures that we keep going forward to make sure that uh, we we uh, basically prevent those communicable communicable diseases. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about your CAC. Like, how many CACs are in Texas? Do you know the number? Seventy-one. Seventy-one, and you're the only one kind of in your area, right? Um, in your county, are you the only CAC in your county? We are the only county that serves uh, Hidalgo and Star counties. We have uh, another uh, CAC that serves the Rio Grande Valley area. They serve uh, Cameron and Willacy counties, but within our county, we're the only CAC. Okay. And then you mentioned the funding. So that's something I've been wondering about. If all of your events are canceled, like we're seeing across the country, um, especially for the CACs, because this is April and uh, the fundraising month, really, and the big event month. What are what are you thinking? I mean, and, and then also the capacity issues you're mentioning. What what do you need people to know? What, you know, we have people that listen to us in Texas. What do they need to hear from you and know about the complications and challenges you have coming up, and how can they potentially help? I I think what what people need to know is that we're continuing to provide services. Uh, I think we feel very proud that our CEC has been uh, recognized as essential personnel, um, but not only by our um, our local officials, but also by state officials. And so, we, they need to know that while uh, you know that there might we might be canceling events, conferences, you know, we're still here providing the services, and more than ever, we need we need their help. Uh, any any uh, you know uh, help monetary uh, help that they can send our way uh, you know I I think it would de definitely help uh, we did uh, have a couple of events that we have planned for this month and for July and right now I can tell you it's not going to happen even our major funders that we had I think we were not able to meet our 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 goal and that was because it was at the beginning of march it was right right before this thing just kind of exploded and so that's what i was saying you know we continue to provide the services um, even throughout the uncertainty of the landscape and uh, we're making every effort to make sure that our facilities are uh, basically uh, safe uh, not only for our employees but also our investigators there and our families that come in you know i i just uh, just allow me to just 
can tell you a little bit of what we've done is like in, even installing UV filters to make sure that uh, in our AC system to make sure that those bacteria that come through through that filter are, are basically killed uh, or eliminated. Uh, so we, I think for them it's just in this month, uh, we need to remember that the CACs are still in the front line provide, trying to provide every, every service. So we, we have not, um, well, we had to kind of work, work around some of the uh, restrictions that we have. We're still there for, for the families, for the children that needs us. Rosita, did you want to add anything? Yes, um, I think that's uh, really important to note that although we are experiencing some, um, uh, I would say, hiccups, we're still able to provide mental health services to any child or family member that may need it. Um, at this time, we've moved on to do telehealth. So all our counselors and therapists have been able to uh, still reach out to their clients, and that's pretty important more so now than ever as a child is home and facing their own uncertainty of what's happening, uh, not being able to be at school uh, and challenging situations with them. And as far as, uh, like Jesus said, all are the other services that we're providing, forensic interviews um, and family advocacy, it's important that we keep doing that. Uh, we are looking into and collaborating with other CECs as far as what that would look like if a, if, if a child uh, maybe is, uh, has tested for, uh, positive for COVID-19, how, how can we provide that service to that child? Because every child matters. And whether we are not gonna have them wait until the pandemic is over before they can tell their story and find uh, someone that can listen to them. We're going to keep trying every single day to find different ways of doing it where, you know, it's confidential and it provides those, that venue to that child to be able to tell what happened to them. So lots of things that are happening, like Jesus said, that are different, but we really want to be able to be uh, trauma sensitive for the kiddos, child friendly in a safe place for them and their families. And what that looks like with COVID-19 right now is a little bit different. But I, I am very proud of our CEC that uh, we've been able to continue to do that and provide every service for every child, no matter what. I mean, it's a little different. You know, we might be doing it through video right now, or we might be doing it in an emergency basis. Uh, but I'm it, it, that's so important for children to know and families to know that we're here. We're always going to be here for them and to, to give them that voice that they need right now. Yeah. Thank you for that. So what kind of things can the community be doing? Because we know children are home with potentially their abusers or in situations with caregivers and that kind of thing. I've been coaching parents around, don't just drop your kid off somewhere without really knowing what you're doing and, and stick, stay away from one-on-ones as much as possible. So what tips do you have for families and, and community members who have kids in their lives right now? Yes. Okay, yeah, so the first thing I've always told, uh, learn the facts. You know, know that you know, one in every 10 kiddos will be sexually abused by the age of 18. That's actually probably gonna, you know, we'll learn those facts to be after COVID-19 will be interesting, but Parents, caregivers, professionals, they need to know the facts. So they're better informed as to how to talk to children. You know, Ms. Penny, you mentioned that minimize opportunities one-on-one. -on -one. It, it is very scary right now for families that are trying to make ends meet. And they might find an opportunity where a person, a neighbor or someone says, just brought the child here. Understand that uh, that may be what they need to do at that time, but it might be, it turned into something pretty, pretty scary for a child, not knowing the person or knowing the person, but being one-on-one -on -one with that person. So minimizing the opportunities for a child to be alone with, whether it is another child or even an adult is very important. I know we're talking about social distancing, so we always try, we're keeping that in mind too, but when it comes to children, uh, we need to have eyes on kiddos and on adults, it, it, minimizing that one-on-one -on -one and the opportunity for someone to be alone with the child. 
um, safe environments, you know, we talk about that all the time. You know, what does that look like? Um, even in our homes, you know, what does that look like? If the kiddos are upstairs and playing hide and go seek with their with the other family members that adults understand that they need to check in, find out what's going on, not just in the home, but social media right now. What are we doing on the computer? What is our kiddos doing? Who are they chatting with? Just really understanding that I think is very, very important. And one of the other things and, um, is really talking to your kiddos at this time. Now is more important than ever to be able to talk to them about those difficult things that sometimes parents refrain from doing, but having conversations about the right, you know, right people, you know, what is a good touch, what is not a good touch, who to tell if something is uh, happening to them that they feel safe to be able to tell someone. Yeah, and I think I agree with you, Josita. I think for me now uh, that we're all in the same home, I think it's the critical time for us as parents to build that relationship with our with our children. You know, if, if we ha didn't have that uh, re a relationship or um, uh, trust with 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 the children, I think it, it's a it's a time for us to kind of talk to them, build that uh, uh, you know strong relationships, and I think key part now with having so much time on our hands and um, having the phones, I think it's critical that we know who they're talking to because it, it's just just like just like us, like we're at home and there's more time really to interact. There's also those people that are not good people that are online basically not, not doing anything other than basically just trying to see who they can, who they can get access to or, or um, basically fishing you know, with, with those children. So we need to be careful with, uh, especially online and, and making sure that we know what our children are doing at all times with the uh, laptops, uh, phones, uh, tablets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and recognizing the signs as, as parents, as caregivers, I think sometimes we are very quick to dismiss something that makes us feel uncomfortable. And so we have to, as parents, recognize the signs. And those might be very, very different one, from one family to another. You know, some children are able to verbalize what's happened to them, or they know that they can tell mom or dad if something's happened or a caregiver. Some children, as we know, uh, they, they, they process the information a little bit different. So telling children that it's okay to ask questions, I think is huge. And for us as parents to listen and to listen to those cues and ask those follow up questions. Tell, you know, why, tell me more about what it is they, they want to know and not shy away from it. You know, we've always talked about sexual abuse being a, a crime of secrecy. And I still think that is very, very true. Uh, we don't, as family members, we don't want to think that that's happening, but unfortunately it is happening. So parents out there, please listen to your kiddos. Uh, look, learn about the signs of child abuse. There are amazing trainings out there online right now that they can jump in. Darkness to Light has some really great free trainings uh, that can really set them up for to understand what abuse is. And I think one of the things that I would also say is to those people that are anywhere listening to us to follow our Facebook page. You know, we're gonna be dishing out a lot of information, uh, you know, statistics, signs, uh, just throughout the whole, not only the month of April, but through, uh, typically throughout the year we do that. So I think it's uh, knowledge is power. And uh, I think um, we all need to know what we need to look for and not ignore them. I think also, uh, as we talk about not only our children, but our children may be hearing from uh, from classmates that you know are are basically out crying to them, and as um, as an adult, we need to make sure that we uh, we take that step and report it. Uh, and and we always the approach that we should take is we should report it and hoping that everything is okay, rather than not reporting and then not, uh, things are not okay. So I I'd rather just make sure that we all know that we need to need to report it and. Uh, in Texas, uh, I think uh, we, we can do it uh, online or 
uh, via telephone as well. I'm pretty sure that's in every state, but uh, uh, I think that's very important that uh, all children may know that um, uh, their friends are going through it and they need to, you know, building that trust will give them the opportunity to tell you what's going on with their friends. So it's very important that we, we act. That's great. Yeah, and we'll provide some of the resources at the end of this um, for the listeners so that we can assure everybody's got the connections that they need for sure. Um, and so one quick thing, and, and I, I've heard this a lot, the implications, the impacts of COVID, and you talked about it, um, screening, medical equipment now that you need that maybe you didn't need before or more of it, um, not easily accessible. How are you managing um, the day-to-day -day changes and challenges of just all of this? Yeah, well, I, I will say here's how you manage it. And, uh, uh, you know, for anyone basically in the hot seat that, you know, fortunately there's a lot of us that have to make decisions that affect a lot of people. Uh, the most important thing that you need to have, and, and I've been thinking about this, is basically you need to dedicate one person to just basically one or two people, if you can, uh, to just keep up up to date with everything that is going on and, and making sure that they're looking for supplies. Right now there's a shortage of supplies. Uh, our center was uh, basically lucky enough that we received a donation of masks and uh, um, one of those full suits uh, sterilized. And uh, But right now basically we, the way we have to approach it is look for supplies every day. And there's, there, there isn't a single day when we're not looking for masks, gloves, uh, and, and that's the way, that's the way we need to operate right now. Uh, and so I would say, as far as the screening, you know, I, I, I feel good that we kind of, as far as the way things were uh, acting or the uh, what were happening in our area, we were almost like a week or two ahead of the steps that we needed to do. And that's thanks to basically having uh, uh, um, access to information what was happening in Washington State. You know, I, I was, I think we were blessed that Rosita was uh, working in Washington State. And so we knew what was coming. And, and I feel like that's kind of basically what helped us put in place things before things had, were coming. Recently, like even uh, uh, our medical director uh, uh, recommended that we screen for runny nose, sore throat, and 99.6. Well, we were sending home people with 99.5. I said, I, I, you know, that could be the start of a fever. So we didn't take uh, anything for granted. You know, we, we, we basically, within the first week of starting screening, we had to send 10 people home and basically put them on a 14 day self quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then within basically three days before they came back, the people that were actually on the front lines, we had to send them home because we, we had someone that came in that notified us that had been exposed to the virus. So it's just like, oh my goodness. So how do you handle that? So, we, and I always say, you know, we're just like one exposure away from having to close the center. And uh, unfortunately, like for three days, we, uh, we had to go emergency only or, and then I made a decision to do for for the whole week because of the, uh, you cannot be too careful. And so the, the screening measures that we have is basically, we're just going over the top. And you know, we, we get our temperature checked in the morning and in the afternoon, and our nurse will hunt you down until she gets that second reading. So those are, that's the way that, you know, that's the way we do it. And, and the same thing, every day you come in, she screens for those symptoms, sore throat, uh, runny nose, cough, shortness of breath, uh, and also uh, basically um, uh, if you've been ex if you've traveled outside the area and if you have been exposed to someone so anyone that is sick right now we're, we're basically recommending for them to uh, to stay home. Rosita did you want to add anything else with the measures? Um, no and I think just kind of circling back to what Jesus said I think it was you know, unfortunate that Washington State got hit so hard so quickly, and it was one of the first states, but we learned a lot from what we were doing here, and that we were able to put some of those uh, practices in place in our, at our CEC, because I was able to reach out to one of the CECs here, right. and uh, Dr. Wood from the Mary Bridge Hospital, and she gave me some really great uh, insight on what they were going through and how they were doing 
day-to-day -day operations at their CAC. So I think, like as Sue said, it was helpful to know what some of the other CACs were already doing here in Washington State before it hit us pretty hard in, in Texas. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's actually right now we're basically, I think, we're peaking just uh, so yesterday we had 99 cases in Hidalgo County alone, um, about 160 in the whole Rio Grande Valley area. So we're basically going up right now. And uh, so we, we, this is the time where we need to take a string measures to make sure that we, we flatten the curve as you know, as that we heard uh, all throughout the states. Yeah, great. Well, I really appreciate you both being here. I think this is great information to help people know what to do in this time and, and what you're experiencing. And hopefully we can drum up some support to keep your services moving and ramping up in preparation for what's to come once school is back. So thank you both. Thank you, thank you for having us, Miss Penny. That's great.